Done today. Yeah, greetings, beautiful. Good morning. I would like to give you all a warm welcome to the digital breakfast today, which is happening on a Monday for a change. Yeah, we have also made the decision that we are going to mix it up a bit because there are individuals who always have specific days for regular communication. So I believe it is advantageous that we are going to be a bit more flexible now. So we naturally have our eye on the other days, Friday and Tuesday as well, but definitely today. Mondays are also pretty good and it's still a pretty good test. Yeah, our topic today is AI, the dark side of the force. A couple of weeks ago, I actually became aware of a paper through a student and immediately reacted. I remember saying, man, that is really awesome. It's amazing how a simple discovery can have such a profound impact. I was genuinely impressed by the findings. So I reached out to Ulrich Bucher, who's the contact here, and he responded really, really quickly. We shot a podcast on the topic within, I don't want to say hours, but days, and I'm super excited. Yeah, we've made it our mission to not just see things through rose-colored glasses, but also to consider the other side. That doesn't mean we're critical about everything, but you should still be a bit careful to consider the other side too. And that's why I'm excited that we're doing this today. The special thing about it is that there are three professors from the dual university in Stuttgart, Ulrich, Marcus, and Kai. It is also intriguing to note that they originate from diverse disciplines, which adds to their unique perspectives and expertise. So you are going to furnish us with a number of distinct viewpoints today, correct? I always believe it is exceedingly advantageous when you not only have a narrow focus, but also when you examine things from a range of different perspectives. That's why I'm glad you guys are here. And honestly, I can't really say anything more about the topic right now. So I'll pass the mic to you guys. Let's begin your stage. Enjoy. Good morning, everyone. Hello. My name is Ulrich Bucher. I'm a professor of general BBL and marketing at DHBW Stuttgart. And I'm excited to take a look at the dark side of AI with you today together with my colleagues Kai Holtz-Weissig and Markus Schwarzer. I don't know about you, but for me, whenever I think about AI, I always get a bit of a mixed feeling. On the one hand, there are, of course, the opportunities and capabilities of AI that we all want to benefit from. And on the other hand, there are many risks and dangers, not to mention the dark side. And the exciting question at this point for us is, how can we achieve responsible handling of AI? And I am looking forward to the conversation and discussion with you. I would suggest that we do a quick round of introductions as speakers, and then I would pass it on. Kai, will you continue? Yeah, good morning, everyone. Kai Holtzweisig, my name. I'm a computer scientist and cognitive scientist by trade, and I oversee the business informatics data science program at our institution. So I'm technically involved with things, but not only that, for me, societal, ethical, moral, and philosophical aspects also play an important role. I'll pass it on to Marcus. Yeah, thanks a lot, Kai. My name is Marcus Schwarzer, and I'm the one who looks at the legal stuff around here. Well, I am a lawyer. I studied law, but I also worked as a spokesperson for different companies and organizations for a period of time. So I always have a perspective that considers both the legal aspects and the communication aspects. All right, Ulrich, let me elucidate an organizational note to you. Our objective is to make the event in a manner that enables you to extract the utmost value from it. Now we have an extremely diverse audience here, of course. 
Some individuals have delved very deeply into AI in the past, while others may be completely new to the subject. Now we obviously want everyone to take away as much as possible from the event. So if you have any specific interests, any questions for us, or any requests, what we should discuss here in terms of content, then we would be happy if you put them in the chat. In the event that is not the circumstance, we have a compact program readily available for you to utilize and benefit from. And this is what the program looks like. Let's take a look at it. We will explore the negative aspects of AI in the first section, taking into account that this is essentially our guiding light before we can then proceed to ask ourselves in the second step, how can we ensure responsible handling of AI in order to mitigate potential risks and maximize benefits? So someone requested us to discuss a little about the technical background. How does artificial intelligence actually work? How should we evaluate the entire thing? And in a third section, we can then take a look at how does our contribution fit into this? That's especially true in the field of research and teaching, as Thomas has already pointed out about the study, the ones we've done here. We mainly focus on the potentials that AI has and how to utilize them on one hand. And on the other hand, we deal with teaching how to approach AI in a responsible manner. And Thomas has already announced it, you know, different perspectives are necessary. That's why we are also a team of three, each bringing different perspectives to the table. All right, if that's agreeable with you, I will proceed and delve directly into the extremely current case. To stir up the discussion and interaction a bit, a colleague of mine who is also a lecturer and teaches scientific work approached me two weeks ago and said to me, hey Uli, I've reviewed two scientific papers and somehow it feels like they used AI without documenting it properly. And her question then was directed at me and I would now like to pass it on to you. What should she do now? She currently has a recommendation for me regarding how to handle these two cases. She had like this vague feeling that there's AI involved, you know? You can actually see that quite well in the language because the language used by students when writing scientific papers naturally has rough edges in one place or another. When they run it through AI, those rough edges disappear. Everything gets smoothed out and polished and the language they say becomes less original. So like based on that, a suspicion is justified and an artificial intelligence deployment takes place. The question was not quite clear for you is it about plagiarism or not? So if that had been the case, the situation would have been simple and straightforward, but we had just noticed that somehow AI had been used. And then the question was, so what does a recommendation look like now? All right, and over there, as I previously mentioned, I would genuinely appreciate putting the question out there or in the chat. What would you do now? You're a professor, right? A college, solid, that's where it will happen. Please put in, Ulrich, I will break the ice. Yeah, thank you, Thomas, for your assistance and support. Well, I am indeed a lecturer with you guys, and I firmly believe that you cannot just ignore or overlook that important aspect. And my suggestion is, you know, every person who has graduated from high school is aware of this, that you simply do not jot down the outcome for mathematics, but also the process of finding the solution. And that's how I see it with scientific papers, that you simply document maybe more cleanly than before. Where do they come from? How do I come up with my thoughts and how do I come up with my sources? Well, I suppose that is the way I see it. I am genuinely curious to see how you professors will actually evaluate that and what criteria you will use to assess it. It's an intriguing process that I'm eager to witness and learn from. Additionally, documentation, which would be one, is the obligation. Do you have any other comments on that matter? Well, the communication with the author. Now, let's not discuss the utilization of AI, but instead focus on the content. Then we will observe to determine if the linguistic finesse in real life possesses the identical quality as it does in the written document. Well, I believe, thank goodness, you will never be able to eliminate this interaction between individuals. Hopefully. Yeah, what can I get for you, sir? Me or what? So, in my opinion, it is incredibly difficult for your purposes 
because I think you really have to differentiate. Did the person just let it out without much intellectual effort or did they work on it in interaction with the LLM, which I admittedly often do? And then the learning effect and the production effect are actually there, having a tangible impact on the overall outcome and results of the process. How do you want to distinguish that? Well, I agree with the prior speaker. You have to talk to them and figure it out. Yeah, precisely. So we need to have a conversation. Do you establish an understanding? Does the outcome match? Does the outcome have any substance? Well, you could also take the position that in the end, there has to be a solution to practical problems in scientific work. And if that's the case, we can say that somehow the person also didn't manage to reach this result. Are there any opinions on that? Yes, this is Stefan Lok speaking. Good day. I am also present here for the first time today. Interestingly, I wrote my master's thesis in late 2022 on the impact of artificial intelligence on employees' effective commitment. I deliberately opted against utilizing AI for text generation, a decision I made with careful consideration. Well, I guess that would be pretty difficult for me to judge right now, considering I'm in your shoes as a lecturer. The thing is, there are, of course, some databases where they can import the standard text to check if there is a suspicion of plagiarism, yes or no. What might be an interesting suggestion, I don't know to what extent it can be implemented in reality, is to simply try to fight fire with fire and also ask an AI if it can evaluate whether this is a text generated by AI. I do not possess knowledge regarding whether they have the capability to accomplish it today. But it might be a good idea to like have a conversation with the student and also evaluate their expertise in addition to that well that is a relatively straightforward matter in the process of writing a paper on caregiving it is important to inquire about a few follow-up questions and delve into a few sources to express well how did you come up with that or how are you interpreting this specific source in the past at least in my studies, that has sometimes, I don't want to say broken someone's neck, but you could already tell that someone didn't work independently. You're touching on some aspects there, AI detectors and such, which already exist today and sometimes claim to have a 98% success rate, but in individual cases, you might only get a percentage. There is a value of approximately 0 0.46 written there. What is the extent of the probability that the text you just entered has been generated by the artificial intelligence? And the question is always, if the whole thing, when five, zero for given, legally secure, or is that not the case? But you see how wide all of a sudden this whole field becomes. With such a super simple case, we've collected an amazing number of aspects in a very, very short time. Kai, you reported it as well. Yeah, precisely. I wanted to discuss the classifiers again. You mentioned them just now. So we have actually already collaborated with these classifiers, but ultimately, as colleague Bucher stated, you are left with a probability and, of course, the probability of incorrectly allocating a five, zero, and ultimately, it is just not legally secure, and we simply have to explore alternative approaches at that juncture. That's not how we're going to solve the problem. The idea is obvious, yeah, tried, but the solution is not very satisfying, yeah. Ulrich? Mr. Frostool, you reached out to me, or Hus. I am not entirely certain about the details of the contact. Yeah, good morning to you too. Uh, yeah, I'm also a first-timer, and I have two aspects, or actually three with the classifiers that just came up. There are usually, on a regular basis, some positives, so to speak, where I wrongfully accuse someone of utilizing AI when they did not actually employ it in reality, even though I later realized my mistake. The other thing is, from my experience, I definitely have to lead the AI in a professional manner. That means it's not like I'm saying I enter a title of a paper and then a perfect text or a perfect thesis magically appears below, but I have to structure it, I have to think it through, I have to work on it iteratively with an AI, and in the end, I also have to understand what I'm doing. And the other aspect is, as has already been acquired, genuinely verifying whether the individual actually knows and comprehends what he or she has written or not, which is of utmost importance. So like targeted checking. And I reckon since AI ain't going nowhere, we fundamentally need different structures for homework, exams, both in school and at uni. 
Yes, because I think that a purely evaluative approach to texts, for instance, will not be sufficient in the future, as artificial intelligence will have a significant impact, and as a result, I need to devise an alternative method to ensure and evaluate student engagement accordingly. Those are some key aspects that you've mentioned. The mere imparting of knowledge in the term paper or in the academic work, that definitely falls short. And of course, one can check it against the argumentation, whether the argumentation is coherent. At ISA today, none of the regulators are able to develop the methodical approach to solving a problem. And that is certainly a starting point to say that when it comes to problem solving here, different requirements arise from an individual case to practice. And there, the possibilities of AI are certainly very limited and would certainly not diffuse the problem here, which highlights the need for further innovation and collaboration in finding effective solutions. Very nice. Well, I think it's great how diverse the aspects are that have been entered or mentioned here now. So in this initial blog post, we are going to take a quick look at the dark side of AI, exploring its potential risks and drawbacks. Ulrich, quickly, since I have been checking out the chat a bit, Mr. Rusiger has an additional idea he wants to share. You mean developing AI to ensure correctness, irrespective of whether the content is correct or not. Can you somehow say something about it that maybe it could be a solution for us? How accurate are the contents that an AI helps us with? So the AI is certainly a tool to prevent abuse. That applies to both the AI of the lecturers and the topic itself. We can actually obtain feedback from the AI ourselves, which is extremely beneficial. And in that regard, there is also the option to say that you can use AI to check if the content is correct. Does it match up with what scientific research yields? There are also tools, AI tools, that perform the search. Even nowadays, Aliset and Consensus and all those names that provide the possibility to check for a research question what scientific findings exist for this research question. So these can also serve as tools to check and verify the consistency of the content statements in the scientific work, enabling assessment of the accuracy and reliability. I am unsure if that was the right approach or was that the right approach to take in that situation? Was it time? Good. Otherwise, Marcus, any more from the chat? Yet another hint was given by Mrs. Hinken, who highly recommended a useful tool called phobits.com to us. We are grateful for her suggestion and will definitely explore phobits.com for our needs. You can most likely also create tasks yourself with it. I do not know, Ulrich. Do you still have any ideas or suggestions? You are our assigned specialist for, have you ever been familiar with the tool? I don't know it, but thanks for the heads up. Thanks a bunch. All right, otherwise I would suggest we dive into the first part. Let's take a look at the dark side of AI. And now we also wanna to get to know you a little better. So what's your relationship with AI like? Do you lean towards optimism, pessimism, realism, or pragmatism in your outlook on life? I have no idea. Firstly, how do you perceive AI? We have presented you with a small study from the scientific research field conducted at the University of Magdeburg and they have delved into the topic of fake publications in the sciences. On the left side, you can observe a snippet from this study on the field of neuroscience, demonstrating how the number of publications has changed over the course of the years between 2010 and 2020. In the publication itself, there is also a graph showing how the proportion of fake publications has changed during this period in this decade. And now the query is directed towards you. What is your perspective on it? Are you currently experiencing optimism, pessimism, or what is your instinctual feeling regarding it? So if you are currently being a Debbie Downer, then take root A and explicitly state that with the help of AI, everything is going down the drain and the number of fake publications is rapidly skyrocketing. Then that would be your curve. Or let's say you're an optimist. We have just been discussing electrons, the classifiers, which you can utilize in the field for various applications. Then you have the option to take the B examination or, you know, we actually do not really know whether you are an optimist or a pessimist. It is a close race and at times the AI is ahead in one aspect, while at other times it is ahead in the other aspect. 
then maybe the exam C, or you're indicating that you're being taken advantage of in this specific situation or scenario. This is in the realm of science and not in the realm of social media. Let's take a look at that in just a moment. In the realm of science, that basically doesn't matter at all, really. Well, then maybe curve D would be right for you. Well, it would be nice if you could do a quick poll there. If you log into m-learning.de and enter your ID there, 151B, 253, and the zero. Let's take a look. What is your perspective on artificial intelligence? So at this moment, we can observe two participants. Now you can see them. Let's see my name. Can you drop the link in the chat? Because here the question frequently arises about where the link is. All righty then. So I'll set up links.land.de. Then take a 151, B253, and go to Big O. So eight participants, nine. I am tuned in. Now it's time to get going. Currently, it is halfway through the hour. The time is 12 o'clock. The current time is 12 noon. Well, we should possess 50% of it. Let us proceed towards our destination. Yeah, if you still want to, let's check the results here. 17, 18. Ah, uh, let me think of a way to reach the desired word count. Hi. All of us are here actively participating and engaging in interactive activities on this Monday morning. You still have the option to add an A and a B to the chat conversation. All right, great. You are able to participate in the chat. Okay, let's examine the results now and see what insights we can derive from them, shall we? So how is it going? Oh, that is a more pessimistic perspective. 10 times the A. Should we watch that? Oh, sorry. The threesome and part here. So now you see it, right? So 12 times the A, twice the B, five times the C, four times the D. And now, Marcus, from the chat you had mentioned. 3A, well, I don't know if they voted twice. That's where we can already see the problems that can arise when conducting verification of scientific publications. Furthermore, in the chat conversation, I am able to identify and count a total of three A's and one B. However, that is a definite vote. Additionally, approximately 15 times A. Therefore, you are stating, for the most part, that when we examine the scientific papers, it is a highly unfavorable development. And you are absolutely right with that assessment. That is precisely and exactly what the research has found in this particular study. That is the original from the publication. You can practically see the entire increase happening. Everything is noticed as potential fake publications. That means it's still a long way from actually being fake publications because we're trying to prove it first. In the right, it wins to prove that the fake publications are, but that's just an estimation of how the fake publications could have developed. When reading through the studies, you will inevitably encounter numerous dystopian statements, such as the existence of over 1,000 paper mills worldwide, particularly in China, that continuously produce fraudulent publications day after day. These publications are created by staff with academic training, including ghostwriters, and can be listed in the Science Citation Index for a fee ranging from 1,000 to 25,000 euros. Those are not just any old tiles around the corner. Those are prestigious scientific publications, and you have the opportunity to purchase your article there. Would you like to buy one? You'll also read something about China how researchers in China and aspiring doctoral students are under significant pressure, failing to publish papers or having already published something means no chance of becoming a doctor in China, 
as China aims to be the biggest player in the scientific field too. Currently, they have already caught up with the United States of America, significantly ahead of Germany in terms of the number of accident publications that we observe in this location. And the question is, what actually occurs at this moment when all of a sudden the entire scientific community, not only the scientific community, which we will examine more closely, is inundated with counterfeit publications? At this very moment, an objection of immense interest emerges and captures our undivided attention. Until 2020, generative AI wasn't common. What's the link between fake publications and AI? So the researchers, uh, that surprised me too, actually pointed that out in their study. The publication itself was released in 2023, so it's not that old. And the question or comment is completely justified, considering that the proliferation of AI has primarily occurred in more recent times. 2018 and big, always more massive increase. But that's not explained in the study either. So in the study, they are essentially stating that in the present day, when paper mills employ artificial intelligence to write publications and produce written works of literature, AI is being utilized. In the past, surely other methods have been used, but that naturally leads to this massive increase that we have seen since 2018, or possibly to this massive increase that we have seen since 2018. Well, there are just a bunch of things coming together on one hand, there's the pressure that researchers and, of course, those pursuing a career in academia and research institutions feel. On the other hand, there are the increasing opportunities that AI brings. And that, from the study's perspective, leads to the fact that, thanks to the support of AI, the number of global publications has already increased enormously. And we can also expect in the future that the share will continue to expand indefinitely. However, Immigration is completely justified. I have pondered the same question myself. There have been more modifications in the work tools, which has also resulted in this higher number of publications, rather than the artificial intelligence, AI, playing any role in this regard. All right, good to know that note. The question is now thrown into the room again, but what happens if science is flooded with fake publications and the thesis that can now be built here is that trust is massively damaged. And the integrity of science and information as well. And that's actually what is a completely dystopian utopia because you know trust is said to be the foundation of any relationship. And the adhesive in society, trust is a factor that enhances productivity, and serves as a preventive measure against disputes and conflicts. And therefore, when we act, and we have done a cooperative project at the Robert Bosch Foundation, when I come across this quote, Robert Bosch, so beautifully, we should prioritize trust above all else. Robert Bosch acted and said, according to this motto, long before there was any kind of relationship marketing, preferring to lose money rather than trust, because the relationships with his business partners were more important to him than the money he earned. And the significance of his merchandise and his statements in this context refers to what he conveys regarding the importance of the individual's values. And I believe they truly enjoyed conducting business with someone such as Bosch because with Bosch, they were aware that if he made a promise, even if it was only spoken and without a written agreement, he would honor his commitment and not compromise at all. That's the difference compared to what we encounter day in and day out today. The pictures that you see here, you know them all. They've gone viral millions of times through social media. AI is being increasingly used to create fake images. Just by flipping through the media in the past two weeks, you wouldn't believe all the stuff they've come across. Joe Biden has frequent encounters with his fake calls, during which they often come across pornographic or fake pornographic content of Taylor Swift's likeness. Over the past weekend, there was a statement indicating that 600,000 posts had appeared on Weibo, the internet service in China, stating that Texas had declared war on the Federation. It is truly unbelievable how incredibly widespread the fake content is, particularly on various social media platforms and channels. There are individuals who assert that there are already a larger quantity of fake contents in existence as compared to true information. That mainly impacts individuals of a younger age group, specifically teenagers who primarily obtain their information from social media 
and are overwhelmed with false information in this particular context. And I'll be right with you, Mr. Dick, you called in. And the problem here is that we humans haven't developed any protective mechanisms. When we observe a video or hear audio and we actively pay attention to it, and we lack any reason or evidence to doubt its authenticity, then we hold the belief in it as real and genuine. Because in the process of evolution, what we have observed or heard has typically been correct. That is the reason why psychologists also discuss processing fluency. We do not question that, we trust blindly. That is also the reason why something like a grandkid's trick works with the help of artificial intelligence. So your grandchild is calling you and now the AI intercepted it beforehand through social media. The grandchild is in the USA. Now you're getting a call because their grandchild uses TikTok too. If you've paused, you know the voice. That is precisely imitating the voice of her grandchild at this moment. You cannot distinguish the difference. And the grandchild says to you, Grandpa, Grandma, I messed up big time, had an accident in the United States, now I am stuck in jail, need $3,000 for bail immediately. And tell me, is it worth it for my parents? I want to avoid the noise. And then they believe that because they have no reason to distrust it. So this Canadian grandmother fell for it. And that is precisely the problem right there, that we simply have not developed any mechanisms, not even the publications themselves, to address this issue. The publications then raise the question, who is actually responsible for the accuracy of the content? And it's the publisher's job to check the content for accuracy. And these mechanisms just mostly don't exist. Did the ex-Jagger get in touch now? Yeah, Felix Tegg. Well, when it comes to IT and AI, I'm a complete novice. I am primarily interested in communication and corporate culture. I simply wanted to reiterate that I have been monitoring the advertising of Bild Zeitung on the radio for a considerable period of time. I am unsure if everyone has heard this, where essentially the voice of Olaf Scholz is being mimicked, and then he states later on, I am not Olaf Scholz, and this is simply an advertisement or something of that nature. And I actually believe that on the one hand, it is a great warning sign because anyone who has no involvement with AI immediately understands what the problem is, that he believes it is Schultz, and then he is not afterwards. And on the other hand, I additionally find it like somewhat moral, you know, to utilize the Chancellor for such a billboard on the radio, in my own personal opinion and perspective. So I just wanted to put it out there again, what the AI can do, you know, just to see what's possible. That's good. Thanks, Mr. Deck. And if you have the same communication background as me, you know people don't understand no. If I inform you at this moment, do not imagine a blue elephant, then you instantly envisioned a blue elephant at this moment. The brain is unable to process the concept of not not processing, so it processes it directly. And that leads to us automatically developing these associations and then potentially deceiving ourselves with the message that could be misleading. According to the World Economic Forum, this is the biggest short-term danger, that is, misinformation and false information that also have an impact on elections and democracies in the next two years. So the biggest danger that comes with AI. Mrs. Hinkin, you reached out to us by phone. We appreciate your call. Yeah, so I, I visit educational institutions and deliver lectures on a wide range of topics and just observe what's happening, you know, and how different it is on one hand with high school students and on the other hand with students in vocational schools. Well, I must admit, I have to say, they do seem to be genuinely interested in learning how to spot fakes and identify counterfeit items with accuracy and precision. I personally have completed a large amount of additional education at the DPA, at the Journalists Association, at the Friedrich Ebert Foundation for verification and also for AI and various other topics. I'm 71 now, and I also enlighten the older folks going to the workshop again this afternoon. But it's almost bottomless, folks. Honestly, I don't even know myself anymore how to deal with all of this. I have the feeling that everything is crashing down on me. I don't know how the others are doing right now. Exactly. That's growing. Marcus, you reached out before. 
Yeah, because right away in the chat, someone asked, so it might be a good time to talk about how this build newspaper advertising thing works and whether it's actually legally allowed. So there is actually the possibility, well, I assume that the build newspaper did not inquire of Olaf Scholz whether they are permitted to do that. And there is, in fact, the possibility to advertise with celebrities without me needing to ask them and without them having the ability to demand monetary compensation for it at a later time. There are several good examples. Sixth is an expert in that area. For instance, they used to engage in this practice, which is still relatively new. I don't believe they did it during the train strike, but in the preceding years, they would frequently capture an image of Klaus Wieselski and include it in their advertisements, along with the caption, our employee of the month. And then Klaus Wieselski sued against it because he's like, that's a violation of my personal rights. They're using my picture without even asking me. And there are a few judgments on that. And Klaus Wieselski consistently experiences losses in that particular location. And that is the thing. Moreover, in relation to advertising, it is often stated that companies, according to popular belief, have the freedom of speech that is protected by law. And this freedom of speech can be published via advertising or more precisely through expressing an opinion. The crucial aspect to note is that the Federal Court of Justice has explicitly stated that if an individual satirically and humorously makes fun of a current event, such as the train strike, and importantly, does not give the impression that this is promoting or endorsing the company in question, then such expression is deemed permissible as it falls within the realm of the company's freedom of speech which is protected by law and considered an essential aspect of democratic societies. So we need two points. First of all, it has to be a current event. Today, for example, this advertisement with Klaus Wieselski wouldn't be okay. Today, no train strike, no current event. But if there's a train strike going on, then we've got a current event. Sixth is mocking it in a satirical and mocking manner. And if it currently states below, under the picture of Klaus Wieselski, employee of the month, then it does not create the impression that Klaus Wieselski is stating now everything goes to sixth. It doesn't indicate he'd recommend this product. Okay, now we need to examine this ad from Bill Zeitung. However, I mean, they always utilize that as an opportunity to criticize the bad politics in some way. They always say something like, as long as we keep making such bad politics, the Bill Zeitung will be after us or something like that. Now, one could, of course, inquire, is this a current event? because presently they are stating that they are engaging in poor politics on a regular basis. Well, one could think about whether that's actually still a current event that they can somehow make fun of in a satirical and mocking way. These are just these two criteria, and you can totally do that. Sometimes six misses the mark on that one. It is imperative to exercise caution. Nevertheless, in this particular scenario, what I mean is that there is, in fact, the possibility of involving celebrities and, by extension, politicians in such matters without providing them with a means to counteract or respond afterwards. That's it from me. And Kai, you provided information that led to its discovery, revealing its true nature. Yes, that's right. I would like to shift the focus again, placing more emphasis on Kainan as the main subject. I am able to understand. The topic is interesting and one tends to digress to current or daily political matters that are relevant in our society. But what we, I believe, have been observing since nine o'clock and what is a recurring theme here is that we have seen it very strongly at the start from the perspective of teaching at universities in research. But now let's take a closer look at the practical side of things. You know, the stuff you deal with on a daily basis. Then, in my opinion, it always comes down to the ability to critically evaluate sources here. A really central skill that we actually already had on the curriculum in schools before AI, which now becomes even more important because what remains at the end of the day when I am confronted with sources and when that is arbitrarily interchangeable in quotation marks and I can no longer rely on it, then all I have left is my own ability to judge whether this is a genuine statement or whether it is a fake statement. And how can I recognize that? That is the question. What kind of context information do I have at this moment? And I believe that's a skill you can practice, you can develop. And I think that also applies to the question from Mrs. Hinken, who asked, 
okay, this feels like a bottomless pit and the world is falling apart. I believe that you can train that and that you can educate that. And of course, that is not just some theoretical thing, but it happens through practice. And I believe that is a crucial point that we must enhance and expand upon in professional practice, but naturally also in earlier stages, such as school, college, and other educational settings. And perhaps at this moment, it might also be a little bit opportune to consider transitioning to solutions. Sure, I'd suggest that given the time we move on to the solutions, stores you haven't checked in yet, maybe just a quick update. I'm up, we should keep going. Sounds good, excellent. Then let's proceed to our second part. So we have already discussed and touched upon the negative aspects of AI. There is obviously a lot, lot more to it, uh, including many ethical considerations. But I think we all agree because, you know, it is about time we start thinking about how we can actually approach artificial intelligence in a responsible, conscious way. And I would not disagree with that statement. Exactly. So I didn't just mention this point because I really want to have my turn and push through my program here. But we can observe that we still have a lot on the agenda and 10 o'clock is not far away anymore. And I believe this aligns quite well. One observation I have made is that I have been relatively quiet for the past 20 to 30 minutes. And it is noticeable that when discussing AI, we have a tendency to anthropomorphize it. We always mention AI and at times it sounds like we are already imparting it with the qualities of a natural individual, so to speak. The AI can do that, the AI does that, etc. And I think what's really important in the whole topic of educating about AI, and I don't know, Mrs. Hinken, if you're doing this too, is to first of all raise awareness about what actually means intelligence in the context of artificial intelligence. And not to make the mistake, in my perspective of anthropomorphizing and suggesting that it is comparable to the intelligence exhibited by humans. And for those of you, and it's too much now to play it here, who want to delve into it a bit more, there exists, and that is already several years old, a thought experiment conducted by the American philosopher John Searle, known as the Chinese Room, the Chinese Room Argument, in which he demonstrates the capabilities of machines as we currently understand them and how they are presently constructed. And in the argument, it ultimately comes down to the fact that an individual is trapped in a room. On the left, Chinese character leaves come in, and this person has a book on how to respond to these characters. The person doesn't understand Chinese, but then gives the response back on the right in the box. And someone who submits papers from outside and gets a different answer sheet back thinks, oh no, the machine understands Chinese, but it actually doesn't. She is completely unaware of the meaning of the characters, but ultimately she interprets them by relying on a set of rules that are written on the left side of the wall. And that's how it is with the machines we know today and the machines we're capable of building today. They do not possess any states of consciousness, that is, They don't interpret, they just work on a symbolic basis, manipulating symbols, but not understanding semantics. They don't know what XY means, what it signifies. And when we start heading towards AI, we naturally also head towards probabilities, statistics, etc. that the most likely item is chosen, for example. So basically, machines are dumb for now, and we shouldn't make the mistake of humanizing them. They only suggest intelligence to us because they apparently behave intelligently in quotation marks by giving us meaningful expenses for corresponding inputs. Sure, let's dive into that. That's a great argument. There are, of course, counter arguments, but I'm not going to go into them further here. Ulrich, let's take it a step further. If you delve into the history of AI a bit, you might think that there was a phase maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago where AI was kind of dead again after being quite hyped in the previous decades. During that time, people distinguished between weak AI, strong AI, and what we have been observing in the last five to eight years, which is that AI has gained a lot of momentum again due to various trigger moments. Currently, we now have the ability to construct models with the right amount of computing power and data, which has contributed to the resurgence of AI and its increasing prominence in various industries around the world. 
And there, the foundation and models are positioned right up front. And based on this foundation of innovation in recent years, we have achieved numerous and also significant advancements in the field of object recognition, for instance, in the area of topic question answering and so forth. And we all know these things today in the form of chat GPT and company. And as I mentioned, it is sort of a cyclical pattern when you examine it over the previous 40, 50 years, the subject matter. However, in my perspective, we have not reached the point where we can talk about machine understanding in the same way as human understanding. We are still operating based on rules and statistics at a very fundamental level. Keep going. The question also came up beforehand to show, hey, how does that even work if we're working with ChatGPT today, for example? What is currently taking place there in relation to software architecture and what are the potential consequences and ramifications? When we use a tool today, which is also a somewhat natural interchangeable image like ChatGPT, then we see an input mask in our browser and then we enter a question or a prompt and then we click on submit. And at that moment, this question leaves our local environment and is sent over the internet to the service provider, such as ChatGPT here, to be evaluated on their platform. When it comes to the input, we are referring to abstraction. We make a request to a trained model, which provides us with a response, and then we generate an output based on that response. In the majority of cases, of course, something meaningful emerges, which makes sense to us as humans, and then these famous aha moments occur, indicating that, yes, the AI is intelligent. Now, obviously, in the context of data protection, etc., it is such that simply through this technical setup, we come across issues like data protection and data security, which are of utmost importance. Please feel free to click on this link to OpenAI's privacy policy here, where everything is thoroughly explained in detail about data protection, etc., and what data about them is actually stored. And in my opinion, for my own feeling, that's not without. That means we have to realize that when we use such services, the data we enter leaves our local context and is externally evaluated, for example, in the USA or in other countries, and possibly permanently stored. And then you should definitely think very carefully about what kind of data you enter there. And especially in the professional context, we naturally delve deeply into the topic of data security. All right, let's keep going. Exactly. Here is a beautiful picture I came across while conducting my research a couple of weeks ago. A monster. And the author, this has been published here on Twitter by the author Anthropath, has this picture. Whether he actually made it, whether he is the primary source, I don't know. But all the clues pointed to it once tried to illustrate pictorially what kind of effort it actually is to build such a model, like we saw in the previous picture for ChatGPT, the language model developed by OpenAI. In order to achieve that, you will need to go through a number of steps and process an incredible amount of data, predominantly data that is publicly available and potentially some data that is not publicly available in order to successfully accomplish the task at hand. This process is divided into multiple steps and it is highly time consuming and resource intensive and different AI and machine learning techniques are employed there and we initiate the process from the top right corner. In the context of machine learning, unsupervised learning refers to an approach where an initial model is built based on data sets without any supervision or labeled data. And this model therefore is a monster that doesn't meet our expectations. That makes racist statements, is obviously also wrong, is discriminatory, and then this model has to be further tamed in various additional training steps, so to speak, so that it shows socially appropriate behavior and that it is not only socially appropriate, but also correct. And that implies there are multiple additional training steps that this model will then go through until ultimately a small charming model emerges on a pathway here, which behaves in a manner that satisfies our human requirements. And with that, the fact that this can even happen 
human feedback is also important. That actually means that female and male testers sit together with the model and train it again with human feedback so that it behaves accordingly to what we consider appropriate. And what is being illustrated here, so to speak, is an absolutely incredible amount of energy and resources that are required without a doubt just to get there and accomplish this remarkable feat. One more, please. Indeed, we have also abstracted it in our book, demonstrating the various stages for those of you who are interested in understanding how we arrive at such a model in different phases of the development process. Okay, without wanting to go into that any further, because we said we want to focus on the solutions now, you know what I mean? That was simply the technical digression. So, like, there are numerous points where we need to, you know, address when we talk about potential solutions. So, we have also developed and formulated several generative artificial intelligence models in our book. Others have already expressed this in different ways before us. We've also grouped them together here again. We see challenges on the human social level, especially that through the use, through the excessive use of generative AI, individual cognitive competences can become impoverished. That means we can just move into a consumer position where we simply prompt the AI and then just accept the result without any critical reflection. That means if we misuse AI, generative AI in quotes, our ability to think critically can become impoverished. Our ability to speak, by the way, even when we ourselves are not able to formulate text, but only to have the AI formulate text, our ability to structure, that means we run the risk of developing a dependency on AI. We have societal challenges, socio-political challenges, the concentration of power in large corporations, discrimination against societal groups, possibilities for abuse, and so on. We are faced with challenges in the legal, ethical, and moral domains pertaining to copyright, data protection, data security, as well as appreciation from authors, so not only take their ideas, but also properly cite them as good practice dictates, and then give them the credit they deserve in order to acknowledge and recognize their valuable contribution. And of course, we also have the topic of sustainability, environmental impacts, so these immense energy cooling costs that we need in order to be able to train and use such models at all. And if we want to answer this question about the dark side of AI, then we believe that we have to approach these four complex topics in order to answer them. And one, let's say, possible answer or direction of an answer, which we have already formulated elsewhere, is to say that in the future, we need to focus on meta competencies and should embrace AI. Just consider it as a tool comparable to how we, in the realm of augmented intelligence, utilize AI to assist us with simple routine tasks, thereby allowing us to concentrate on more valuable, mentally and cognitively demanding tasks that necessitate advanced skills and critical thinking abilities, enabling us to maximize our productivity and effectiveness in achieving our goals. And that applies equally to professional practice as well as to the university context. Good. Wow, that was an absolutely perfect landing, right? Exactly. 10 o'clock. I think there were still some hints in the chat. I don't know, Thomas, if you want to do that. I did mention that we also record where there is a hard strike. They can leave and request a newsletter. Then they will receive the recording today. If you have a few more minutes, I would just like to make a statement about what's going on in the chat. And maybe there are still a few questions on the audio track. I would like to mention an additional point. Mrs. Hinken brought up something about it in the chat, particularly with regards to data protection that caught my attention and I believe is worth discussing further. They say that chatting in Italy is prohibited. That was actually the situation. I wanted to mention it briefly. In Italy, GenGBT was actually temporarily removed from the market, so to speak. They stated that it is not permitted due to privacy concerns. However, I believe that it is now acceptable once more, and therefore it can be used again in Italy. 
However, it is indeed true that the Federal Data Protection Commissioner, along with several state data protection commissioners, have sent questionnaires to OpenAI, as confirmed by reliable sources familiar with the matter, with a request for an answer, and they are required to provide a response in terms of data protection. Additionally, there are already ongoing efforts in the background to take a closer look at that matter and examine it more thoroughly. I mean, it is also important, as I mentioned previously in the podcast, we cannot leave this, as the emperor always refers to it, this powerful tool to computer scientists, but we also have to establish rules right from the beginning. That was, in my opinion, a feather in the cap of the internet back then, that we just let everything run like that, and then some things crept in that we can't undo today, like pseudonymization, anonymization on the internet that I can be out there with any old nicknames. That was also a point that had been addressed previously, by the way, you have to take responsibility for what you do and say, and that applies to the internet as well, naturally. That's why it's important to use your real name, your clear name, when you're online and not some random nicknames. That was quite a statement, you know, like whatever, okay. Mr. Kramer, you still have one additional treatment remaining to complete your full course of treatment. Yeah, precisely. And Mr. Holtz, apologies, just mentioned that we are allowing AI to assume control of straightforward tasks. I am curious, what kind of revenue do we or the companies generate for young executives in terms of income and opportunities? If you say, let me take care of simple tasks. I work as an interim manager. I see many companies Many companies let the application go through a filter, whether you can call it AI or not. Let it go through a filter and think around the corner. They fall out because they build their application as they are, as they think, as they act. Very individual. What happens? AI sorts them out, throws them out, but takes the streamlined ones that fit exactly into the AI grid, take them, and then we get a whole bunch of apologies. Chinese and Japanese people who have learned to think in clear structures lose what makes us Germans creative, namely individuality and thinking outside the box. I do not think AI is capable of thinking around the corner yet. My successes in the market, like Remover and others, were because we learned to think outside the box, market suitcases through Lufthansa and more, which AI cannot do at this point in time. In my perspective, on the flip side, the companies bear the responsibility themselves if they solely hire cookie cutter individuals who fail to meet the requirements of the AI test. And in my opinion, I believe that is something that companies should take into consideration by acquiring the expertise of creative individuals once more. I will simply proceed and reply to that directly. I believe it is absolutely incredible, the statement and also the critical attitude towards it. I by no means wanted it to be understood as a blanket statement and screening applications is definitely not something I personally, that's just my own opinion, will leave to AI. I am referring to less complex activities in that context. So in the field of software development, for instance, I could propose certain source code comments generated by the AI, which I would subsequently either approve or reject, or perhaps some logging statements, which are truly basic and unremarkable. Or to put it more bluntly, the space for me personally, meaning my own personal perspective, to actually use AI productively is very limited, even today, despite all the hype we see in society, media, etc. experience. But maybe that's also because I'm just critical there and I've also mentioned it elsewhere. I just appreciate honest hard work. Yeah, because I simply have the fear that we as humans will lose central competencies through it. Yeah, and that we will simply become impoverished in terms of competence. Yeah. That is my perspective. To be completely honest, I am not truly a fan of that. Thanks a million to you three individuals. You are the best. Yeah, I thought it was awesome. You could tell from the discussion, of course, that we might have a new AI 2.0 in mind, maybe a bit later. I would love to do that. Thank you for being here. Stay loyal, stay healthy and lively, stay critical. And until next time, bye. Have a great time and a nice week. Thank you.